To understand the importance of events in Russia this weekend, we have to turn the clock back a bit to 2014, when the Wagner Group was first identified fighting to seize Crimea from Ukraine. At the time, it was thought to have about 5,000 troops fighting mostly in Africa and the Middle East. Fast forward now to January, when the Ukraine, Minister, Ukraine the UK Ministry of Defense put its numbers at 50,000 fighters in Ukraine alone. Those troops, most recru recruited from Russian prisons, played a crucial role in the war, particularly in places like Bakhmut in the east, where some of the bloodiest and longest battles of the war took place. With me here now is former U.S. Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper. Years of experience, decades, I should say, uh, looking into Russia and what's happening there. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Jim. So first, on Putin's leadership. Is Putin, does he emerge from here irreparably damaged? Well, he's clearly damaged. I, I think uh, irreparably remains to be seen. I think uh, we're perhaps rushing to judgment here about the end of Vladimir Putin. And I don't, I think it's a little early to do that. But clearly his stature, his prestige, uh, his image is diminished both internationally and, and domestically, um, which is one of the reasons why I don't think he's going to let a Pergozin run around uh, yeah. free and easy. What is the fate of the Wagner Group, which has enormous military influence, I mean, its role in Ukraine, central, its role in Syria, the war in Syria, central, its role in several little wars in Africa that, that Russia has interest in central, but also Prigozhin with his own power center inside, inside Russia. Are Prigozhin and the Wagner Group now themselves irreparably damaged? Well. That remains to be seen and is a, gr a critical question, is what is the fate of uh, the Wagner Group? And as you indicated, in Ukraine, they're the most effective fighting force that the Russians have had, and they're very active and, from the Russian standpoint, very effective in lots of other areas that, that you enumerated. So that's a great question. What is going to happen to them? They are ostensibly under the loose aegis of the GRU, uh, Military Intelligence Organization, which also controls the Spetsnaz, their special operations forces. So there is somewhat of a functional kinship there. And whether the uh, Russian government would attempt to have a more, more control over the Wagner Group and its activities by tethering it to some element of the, of the government, Ministry of Defense, GRU, whatever, remains to be seen. But it's clearly, uh, this is a big problem for the Russians because of its effectiveness. Yeah, no question. Uh, so the public story is that Prigozhin peacefully ended his advance towards Moscow, has taken a deal to go to Belarus, and some of his forces are going to sign up with regular Russian army units, uh, and Prigozhin's going to live safely uh, in Belarus. Do you buy that deal? Well, Jim... Uh... Maybe I spent too much time in intelligence, but this whole thing, this deal, to me, is kind of fishy. Mm -hmm. uh, that all of a sudden, it goes and stopped, uh, turned left or turned back, and then he's going go to agree to, to go, all, of all places, Belarus, which is essentially, from a security standpoint, an extension of Russia. I, can, I, just, I, I just wonder whether it was a deal or somehow, behind the scenes, um, Putin exerted some, some form of leverage over Prigozhin uh, that caused him to, to fold. Uh, this is an unanswered question, obviously, and uh, hopefully as, as we learn more, we'll find out just what happened. But it, on, on its face, it's a little fishy to me. For, for, for a moment this weekend, I, I know that Western intelligence was looking at this and speaking of open military confrontation uh, in, in Russia. There are still militias. There's still a Wagner militia. There's still other militias, um, uh, other potential challengers to, to, to Putin's leadership or at least to, to factional fighting there. Does the U.S., does the West have to prepare for at least the possibility of Russia becoming a failed state? Well, absolutely. I mean, and there are those out there, there are the Russia watchers who are already are saying this could easily be the beginning of the end of the Russian Federation. I personally think that Again, that's a little premature, but it could be. And as far as U.S. government needs to be prepared for all those, uh, all those options. Above it all, though, from, <clears throat> I'd say this, from an intelligence standpoint, 
anytime you have a, a nuclear power in a situation like this, you, you get real sensitive about the status of their nuclear forces. So that'll be, I'm, I'm quite sure, uppermost in the minds of the you know, intelligence community. Was there at any point, do, do, do you think, this weekend, the threat that Russia's nuclear weapons were at risk? No, uh, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, uh, and I felt that way from ever since the invasion. That while, despite the threats, that obviously the, pro the probability of the use of uh, nuclear weapons is is not zero, but it's still pretty low. And I don't think this situation uh, changed that. There, there, U.S. intelligence folks have told me for some time that, that, that if Putin were to lose power, he's far more likely to face a threat from his right flank than, than from any sort of progressive, you know, inside the country. If he were to leave power, who, what kind of person, shall, shall I say, from, from what category uh, would be most likely to, to, to replace him? Would it be someone more aggressive, more? Well, I would, uh, I think it would, uh, it all would all depend on the circumstances of his departure. Mm. Um, if he were to depart, uh, I've always, you know, he does have a, a close inner circle, which is, is held together pretty well. I've always wondered about his national security advisor equivalent, Petrushev, as to whether he might emerge, uh, but a longtime crony, KGB crony of, of, of Putin's. Um, so, but I, I agree, I think, that with you that the, the uh, of the two theories, uh, an attack uh, or, uh, of some sort from the right is more likely than, than the left. Final question, if I can, in terms of the effect on the ongoing war in Ukraine. If you were advising Ukrainian leaders now, military commanders, would you say, now's the time to strike even harder? Well, actually not. I think I'd probably tell, if, if I were in that position, uh, the Ukrainian military to just press on with what they're, they're already, they've already got underway. Um, and let the disarray take, you know, take its course um, among the Russians. The thing you want to think about is if you get very aggressive right now, will that provoke a, uh, a counter right. a retali a retaliation that we might not want to see? So I, I think they just need to press on with what they're doing. And uh, I think the demoralization and the incompetence of, of the Russian military is probably going to be emphasized even more because of this, this event. More questions about their will to fight. Uh, Director James Clapper, thanks so much for joining. Thanks, Jim.